Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to uh, the ORF book discussion and book launch of Fossil Free by Mr. Suman Sinha. Uh, he describes uh, the need to reimagine clean energy in a carbon constrained world. We are joined by Mr. Amitabh Kant, who will launch the book, and thereafter uh, it will be followed by a discussion. And we are joined by Kate Hampton from London, who uh, has been uh, spearheading lots of initiatives around the world uh, for the green transition and is advising the UK government on the COP26 that is uh, to be hosted in November in 2021. Uh, before I turn to Suman, let me first invite Mr. Amitabh Kant to formally launch the book. Uh, Mr. Kant, you have a copy with you. Uh, and I would like you to uh, unwrap it and launch it. And I will request uh, then after all three of us to, to uh, hold our books in the air by, by way of the digital launch uh, of this particular book. This is uh, Suman, the launch of your book. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Samir. Yeah. Thank you very and much. Let me uh, begin with you, Suman, before okay. I turn to Mr. Khan. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for uh, uh, launching the book. Suman, let me ask you. Uh, a question as we before we turn to Mr. Kant, uh, why this book? Why does a person who was in the financial sector and started investing in the green business uh, find it important to put together this very important piece of uh, literature? Uh, what drove you? What were the drivers? And why? What, what do you want as an outcome from this effort? Well, you know, thank you so much, uh, Samir. First of all, for arranging this book launch, and I'd like to thank Mr. Kant and Kate for uh, for uh, being part of this event. Um, it's obviously a little bit odd to wear masks and speak, but I think in today's day and age, that's the most uh, safest thing to do. Uh, so look, I think the reason why I wrote this book is because, you know, uh, I've been now working in the, uh, in the clean energy space for the last 10 years. And what I realized is that over the last 10 years, there have been a tremendous number of changes in our sector. And we've now got to a point, especially over the last couple of years, where uh, renewables has actually become a lot cheaper than anything else in terms of any other form of energy. And I realized that we are therefore going to be living through some very fundamental changes in the entire energy mix. And that if I were to just sort of extend that, I realized that we were living really in the age of an energy transition. That has happened maybe a couple of times in humanity's history in the past. And because it all so deeply sort of enmeshed in our daily lives, we're not really recognizing the enormity of the change that is happening around us. And so I felt the need to document this change, to heighten the awareness about it, and just make sure that more people got to be aware of the fact that, uh, that there's such a massive change upon us. So that is one aspect. The second aspect is the fact that, of course, we all know the whole issue of climate change. It's a very real issue, right? And we've all been struggling as, as, uh, you know, as a globe to try to find the appropriate solutions for that. And uh, renewable energy actually offers hope in that it is one of those very important solutions. And so therefore, here you have this very, um, coincidental but f fortunate uh, combination where something that is good for the environment and good for the climate is also commercially making a lot of sense. And therefore, you know, uh, it's, it's a very sort of positive coming together of both of these requirements. And then as I look forward, and as I started looking forward and looking out 10, 20, 30 years, you know, you realize that, uh, that this whole uh, sector and this whole area is going to grow so substantially and it is going to become part of our everyday lives in many different ways. Today, renewable energy is mostly renewable electricity. Mm -hmm. But in the decades to come, and the years to come, it's going to become a much bigger part of our energy basket. And I think that's, those are the kinds of things that I really wanted to talk about, which is to really highlight the change that is upon us, uh, make it known to more people, uh, talk about how big the opportunity would be in this sector, how electric vehicles, how the power sector itself would undergo change, and how all of this would then translate into um, great opportunities in terms of job creation, creation of massive industries, industrial sectors, and how this was at, at heart also a massive investment opportunity for people certainly such as us. So I'm going to come back to the investment opportunity uh, in a bit, and I I'm particularly interested in the India playbook that you uh, in some sense described in the book. Uh, perhaps it's also a lesson for other countries. And I'll come to that with Kate and uh, Mr. Khan. Mr. Khan, let me turn to you at this stage. Uh, we have heard our Prime Minister speak green. And he has spoken green since 2015. Very early in his first term, he decided that India is going to change the narrative, uh, uh, its climate narrative. And he has built a whole uh, new uh, mood 
uh, for us to shed the uh, the old hesitations and uh, embrace the new opportunity is india ready in this new decade as we as we move to 2021 we are entering the third decade of the 21st century is this decade going to be a decade of india going green at a retail scale rather than just at the grid scale thank you uh, samir for that uh, very interesting question but let me first uh, first of all let me congratulate sumanth for taking this initiative of writing a fascinating book on the important topic of energy transition in the context of climate change and economic growth. Uh, I've read the book entirely and the book is uh, very written, you know, very elegantly written and it builds a narrative around the energy revolutions that have shaped the human evolution. Uh, you know, the great thing about the book is that it starts with the industrial revolution led by coal then explains the oil and gas paradigm. Uh, book gets us around the current clean energy revolution that is unfolding in front of us. Uh, he also illustrates the essentiality of a market based solutions and the immediate need for radically scaling up clean energy investments. So it's a very, very fascinating book. Let me now turn to your question. And uh, I'm uh, I'm particularly delighted but not surprised by the recent revelation in the climate transparency report that India is the only country among G20 nations that is on track to meet what it had promised in 2015 under the Paris Agreement on climate change. Unlike the other top three emitters, China, US and EU, India's track record of being the only two degree compatible country was flagged in this report released last Wednesday by a coalition of 14 global think tanks, which showed that the other 19 leading and emerging were far away from achieving their goals. Now, India is one of the, uh, you know, top five renewable energy countries in the world by capacity. India's total renewable power installed capacity is about 89 gigawatts. Uh, we've our target of 175 gigawatt of renewable energy will be more than met by 2022. And we are on way on target to achieve 450 gigawatt by 2030. Uh, in addition, 37 gigawatt of solar and 9 gigawatt of wind is under implementation. Uh, we are aspiring for 30 plus gigawatt addition in every forthcoming year to reach the 450 gigawatt target by 2030. Uh, you know, the challenges that India faced in getting here uh, and the immediate opportunities from here on are pretty well explained by the book. Uh, this book is actually a very fascinating, it tells the story in a very fascinating way. Uh, but, you know, my view is that uh, uh, a clean energy powered by a set of clean technologies uh, is critical for India. And uh, we need to get into a, a whole range of uh, clean energy deployments. Uh, we, uh, for us, it's very important simply because our electric mobility is very important. Uh, we, right now, we have only about 20 six cars per thousand people, unlike 980 cars per thousand people for USA and about 880 odd cars for the uh, European Union. And therefore, uh, the future will be shared, connected and uh, uh, an electric world of the future, zero emission world for the future. And therefore, the area of battery storage will be very critical for India. And uh, this, to my mind, is very important, and several initiatives have now been taken by the government in this regard. Also, I think as, it's very important that India in the long run becomes a manufacturer of uh, solar products in India. And uh, it's uh, one of the things we've tried to do is to push this production-linked incentive scheme for clean tech manufacturing. And our view is that uh, it's very important for India to get into cutting edge areas where the world will be uh, four to five years down the line and start, uh, you know, the, because 
solar energy also there's a lot of technological disruption taking place in several areas and it's very important for us to embrace these sunrise technologies which are going to be futuristic and then focus on them uh, and become uh, very advanced of other countries but one thing is very clear that you if you look at the valuation of uh, e-vehicle giant tesla in august 2020 which has reached us dollar 380 billion and become more than the next 12 automakers combined and the spikes in valuations of companies like nikola and other clean tech companies uh, this all this clearly points towards the fact that clean technologies are becoming a darling of investors and in fact to my mind, the market is now looking for the next Tesla across the clean tech industry. And uh, the other thing is that Exxon Mobil falling off Dow Jones industrial average after nearly 100 years of being there is a sign that this trend will only accelerate. And therefore, getting into sunrise areas, electric mobility, manufacturing, cutting edge technologies of uh, this are really the areas of the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think you, you paint a very bullish and optimistic view of uh, India's journey. Uh, Kate, that must be music to your ears. Uh, uh, but let I, I have so much to ask you. But I mean, you know, uh, why is India important to green transition? Do you think the world is sufficiently paying attention to the needs of India to make those green transitions? Uh, what should COP26 be working on to ensure countries such as India can emerge as the as the leaders of this new world that Mr. Amitabh Khan so eloquently described. Uh, thanks, Samir, and a fascinating conversation already. Um, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, India has the absolute potential to be a superpower of the clean energy revolution and is, in fact, moving in that direction. Um, India has taken, as Mr. Khan pointed out, a leadership role already in terms of implementation. Um, and um, also a really important role in institution building and international collaboration with the International Solar Alliance and uh, CDRI on resilience. And, and so there's, there's huge potential for India to uh, lead. Um, and I think there's a, a, an opportunity now that the world is listening uh, with the run up to COP26 for India to really uh, uh, stand on the world stage and be really clear about um, how India intends to collaborate with others and also the near term opportunities for acceleration in India with that uh, international collaboration. Um, and there are a number of uh, items that uh, India could collaborate on the UK with. As you know, the UK is the fastest decarbonizer in the G20, has already cut emissions by 40% against 1990 levels, just committed last week for a 68% reduction against 1990 levels by uh, 2030. Um, and even in the midst of COVID and Brexit, um, um, lots of action is being taken on clean energy. So I think there's a huge opportunity for India and the UK to collaborate um, as two leaders um, in, in decarbonization, in climate change, um, and really hold hands uh, in terms of green finance um, and, and many of the areas um, that the two speakers have mentioned already. Um, India has a real opportunity to be a leader in uh, electrification of mobility, including through two and three wheelers, uh, which is material. Um, I'm joining you from a car free development in London. I live in a building where you're not allowed to have a car permit and there is no car park. So only sharing shared mobility um, and and two wheelers are allowed. And this is the shape of things to come. This is a, an improvement in my quality of life compared to being surrounded by um, internal combustion engines. So um, whether it's green cities, green mobility, uh, green energy, India is already positioned for leading leadership um, and could actually demonstrate near-term acceleration in a way that many other countries don't have the capacity to do with the right international cooperation. So I'm really excited to see what happens over the course of the coming months as the UK and India discuss collaboration around um, the transition and around uh, clean energy finance. At this stage, let me invite the viewers to also post their questions. I will try to weave them into this conversation. So please feel free to use the text box, send us your questions, and I will post them to the uh, panelists and to the author. Uh, Sumant, uh, the pandemic. How is the pandemic implicated 
the green transition. Uh, you know, there have been uh, examinations of stimulus packages. Are they green? Are they brown? Are they status quo? Uh, how has India fared in terms of continuing with its green journey in the face of such adversity? And we have limited budget. We have limited needs. We have to respond to our development needs. How would you, uh, if you were sitting in Mr. Amitabh Khan's uh, chair, what would be the four or five ideas that India could implement now to restart the economy, to meet its development needs, and to be a green leader? Well, you know, um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, I must say that, you know, the government has taken certain very critical steps to protect the clean energy industry. And I think more than the steps themselves, it signals the government's resolve to really move forward with clean energy as being the fulcrum for the power sector in the future. And the steps that they've taken, for example, they've continued to be uh, new auctions for new capacity. So I think that is something that has been very positive. It's continued to keep the momentum going to wherever required because construction at sites was, was stopped. Uh, they were, you know, agreed to give extensions. And very critically, they've actually injected a lot of liquidity into the distribution company sector, which then eventually has been meant to pay clean energy companies like us. And so I think all of that has actually been very positive. And as I said, the fact that renewable energy companies have continued to, you know, move forward with the must run status that we enjoy. And so therefore, all the power that we've been generating, despite the fall in power demand by almost 25%, uh, the renewable sector has been protected. So I think in that sense, the government has very clearly said that, look, uh, between conventional power and renewable energy, we have to protect the renewable energy sector because that's the area that is going to grow in the future. So I think it's had a very important signaling mechanism. Now, to your question about um, uh, what are the areas where the government could actually move forward on. So I think that, you know, Mr. Khan talked about the production-linked incentive uh, program that the government has come out with for in our sector, particularly for batteries as well as for uh, solar manufacturing. Now, my one rec suggestion really in a way would be that, you know, the PLI scheme by itself is great. Uh, as, as potential investors in manufacturing in India, what we require in addition to that is a longer term roadmap for, for example, things like customs duties, right? Uh, because PLI is a scheme, is a good scheme, but we need to understand the totality of all the things that are going to happen. So customs duty to prevent imports, cheap imports is one thing. The second thing is, especially in the case of batteries, is demand creation, mm -hmm. right? So, of course, you know, one set of one one kind of demand comes from the utility storage area, but that's somewhat limited. The bigger demand actually comes from the electric vehicle uh, mobility segment. Now, there there is no specific mandate at this point in place that by 2030 onwards, for example, a certain X percentage of cars have to become electric in nature. If those kinds of mandates come in, then people can start then really understanding what is going to happen on the demand the side. The yeah, exactly. So then we can start figuring out, okay, this is the demand, this is the customs duty, this is the PLI scheme. So once you have the totality of the information, then you're in a much better position to make the investment. But the same thing applies in solar manufacturing as well. Uh, again, we have the PLI scheme, but we're still awaiting details around the BCD roadmap. Mm -hmm. Now the government is working on it, and I'm sure it will come out eventually. Uh, it is just that you know, it then delays the process of actually making the investments happen. So I think it's in those kinds of areas where perhaps, uh, you know, the totality of the whole policy can emerge together. Uh, and then that allows people like us to make decisions which are, you know, more more immediate and, and, and you know, then we can make, make more definite decisions and then go ahead. Mr. Khan, let me read a segment from uh, Suman's book. And I want to pose this question to you and Kate both, because Kate is also one of the uh, 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 important voices that is shaping global discourse on this. Uh, he says that we need more of supply chain in India. We cannot have a situation where we import renewables, such as 5 billion worth of solar panels and 10 billion worth of batteries from China every year. We will merely be replacing our energy dependence from the Middle East to China. Even if the cost is a little higher initially, energy markets in India should absorb that cost to develop a manufacturing industry locally. Sir, is the government thinking of the new energy insecurity that could result from the shifting of uh, uh, our energy consumption patterns and energy itself. That's a very important point. And uh, uh, actually, the production linked incentive scheme for both the automobile sector, and these are the two biggest schemes that we have done, uh, both for the automobile sector and for the solar energy sector, are both designed to make India a manufacturing base 
for solar PV as well as for automobile components, particularly EVs. Uh, one must realize that, you know, quite often we in India get into the sunset areas of industry. And it's very difficult if you try and say that you're going to become a great manufacturing nation in what uh, other countries are already doing. It's very difficult to get the size and scale right and penetrate and produce at the right cost. Uh, because the great thing about India right now is that we've been able to uh, break records in terms of the prices which are coming through the transparent competitive bidding process. We've touched rupees too. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's very important that we manufacture uh, to both to global size and scale. Now, the challenge is that uh, the, what other countries are producing to large scale, that itself is going through a technological disruption and the world is getting into new areas. They're getting into polysilicon to direct wafer bypassing ingots. They're getting into heterojunction technology. They're getting into tandem cells. And my personal view is that these are areas, these are new areas of energy where the world will be in the next three to four years time. And India should bypass existing technologies and get into completely new areas of technology where the world will be three to four years down the line and become a champion for the world. It's the solar energy industry must not look only at India, but look at actually becoming a manufacturer for both India and for the rest of the world. And similarly for batteries, batteries, while today the world is at lithium, uh, there will be a whole range of new technologies. So, uh, you know, uh, solid state batteries, lithium metal batteries, lithium sulfur batteries. And I think this is where the real game is that three to four years down the line, these new technologies will capture the market and Indian entrepreneurs and Indian startups met, must get into these new areas of growth. Kate, uh, I think the same question to you phrased differently. Are we inevitably creating this huge China factor in our energy supplies? Are we stumbling into a new dependency that might have collateral impact uh, uh, down the road? Yeah, so it's a it's a tricky one. So from a global public goods perspective, clearly you want um, as many countries as possible to have a commercial stake in the future. So you want many, many countries involved in manufacturing um, and deployment of these technologies. Um, and um, that's why so many countries are participating in mission innovation and also in technology collaborations and and deployment is ultimately what drives the, having the right enabling environment for uh, deployment is ultimately what drives innovation is what drives costs down so you need a combination of those factors um, but it is true that it's important to make sure that sources are adequately diversified for a range of uh, geopolitical reasons um, and that there are, are really good options for India and um, Mr Kant has, has mentioned many of them the digital revolution that is inevitable in terms of increasing the efficiency of energy use is a really key piece cooling technologies. Um, India has already used market transformation initiatives in the field of LEDs. Um, cooling and building up the cold chain across the world, um, both in terms of um, space cooling, but also uh, the cold chain and preventing post-harvest loss. All of that is going to be really, really important. As I mentioned earlier, two and three wheelers. We can't have this world uh, clogged up with um, electric four wheelers. We won't solve any of the congestion problems. Um, so more and more people are going to have to be walking, they're going to have to be cycling, and they're going to have to be using electric cargo bikes. I have an electric cargo bike that I take my kids to school on, um, and it's a, a lot of fun and the kids love it. Um, you also need to look at agriculture. India is already starting to demonstrate real leadership in in low carbon and resilient agriculture um, and some of those technologies will be widely deployable across the world um, and nature-based solutions as well. Um, there's a, a huge evolution happening in terms of bringing together industry, circular economy um, and, and ecosystem service provision um, and we've also heard the story about batteries which is going to be so crucial in India um, for dealing with that nighttime peak. Um, India is going to have to find really thoughtful uh, storage solutions um, to really 
um, get rid of existing coal. So I think there's vast opportunities for India. I'm less concerned about the geopolitics as long as everyone has a stake in the global public good of preventing climate change um, and uh, countries continue uh, to operate in a rules-based order. Um, but, you know, we we all have different views about that unfolding. So I don't want to take uh, take us down a new route in the conversation. Uh, it, unfortunately, your optimism may not be shared by many in a year that we have been stuck by the pandemic and international cooperation clearly did not work. But uh, just to uh, illustrate the, the point you're making, I think we have a question from a, a viewer. In fact, we have a question from Mehir Sharma uh, who says, should we not accept that demanding complete self-sufficiency in batteries or PVs will in fact harm the green transition? It is arguable whether it helps manufacturing, but certainly it will have price impacts. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea of self-sufficiency might actually be an impediment for green transition. Uh, uh, should I pose it to you and uh, Mr. Karsuman? Yes, yeah, sure. No, I don't agree with that contention, actually, because, you know, um, we've now got to a point where solar is so cheap, in fact, right? Uh, at, at, at 2 rupees or 2 rupees, 25 yeah, no, paise no, or something, no, no, no. that even if we increase the cost marginally, uh, make it 250, 275, even 3 rupees, it's still 40% cheaper than coal-based power. So there's enough room for us now to use that, to use that exactly to, to really start getting into other areas. Uh, manufacturing, I think, of course, is, is an important area. Batteries is another important area, which in any case required to manage the intermittency, which also imposes cost, by the way. So managing it from the, you know, having a battery manufacturing, all of that, I think, is very important. So I think the Indian ecosystem can now absorb these costs. And longer term, look, the reality is if you have manufacturing investments in India, you will have more and more R&D happening because R&D sort of follows manufacturing. And you know you'll have Indians, you know Indian companies, and getting into uh, much more efficient manufacturing over time, and then actually becoming much more competitive with even the Chinese. There's no reason for us not to be competitive with the Chinese. So give give this whole manufacturing ecosystem four or five years to develop, okay. and I think we can, as Mr. Khan said, become exporters to the rest of the world as well. So Mr. it's Mr. not. Khan, a, let me yeah. pose a different question to you again from our viewer by Madhur Kalra. Uh, she asks uh, rather. Uh, that, uh, directly and bluntly, how do we bring states in line to reform discords? I think if, uh, and uh, probably Kate can also come in on Africa on this aspect. Uh, uh, grids are the vulnerabilities <laughs> of all transitions, uh, uh, energy transitions, you know, like the, the, the grid systems, the ownership, the recovery pattern. Do you think we have made uh, sufficient progress? Do you think there is sufficient appetite in the Indian uh, federal arrangement to move towards the transition that the center has been so loudly advocating for? Yeah, so I think um, reform of distribution has to be the number one barrier to the clean energy revolution in India, in my view. Um, I, it's really, really hard work. It is really, really hard work. And I don't want to underestimate the complexity around the political economy of power sector reform in any country <laughs> at any level. Um, but I think I think without solving that problem, it will be very difficult to unleash um, the decentralized energy revolution that's so necessary. And with that, all of the innovation innovations that come because um I very much agree that, that there is no reason why in a very low cost uh, renewables world, why India uh, can't compete and can't actually have a very significant supply chain domestically. India has the scale. Renewables are going to be com competitive no matter what. Um, but I think without unleashing the right reforms, without really significant power sector reform uh, on the distribution side, I think that will be a real impediment. And I think this is an important lesson as well for um, the mobility revolution because the impediment is not going to be uh, the um, electric vehicles achieving parity with the internal combustion engine. The impediment is going to be uh, charging infrastructure. It's going to be grid infrastructure. So again, this systems capability is absolutely crucial and, and interrelated. So if you don't solve the distribution problem, you won't also benefit from um, a rapid electrification of the vehicle sector. So it's all interrelated. And India has no question the technical capability to do this, um, but reforms are hard, and 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 you've just got to press ahead if you if you want to be a leader. So, uh, Mr. Khan, what is your take on uh, the, uh, the the mood across the country on around this green transition? You interact with all state governments. You meet lots of leaders in 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 different parts of India. Do you think this is now a a, a secular determination of a nation to go green? And you see this present everywhere. So this is uh, you know the earlier question that you asked. Kate uh, was really the crux of it all. And uh, 
uh, if you want to sustain this over a long period of time, then DISCOMs need to be reformed. And uh, the central government has already sent a clear political will by announcing as a part of the Atman Nirbhar package that all union territories, the DISCOMs will get privatized and actually many union territories like Chandigarh, Daman and Diu have already and Pondicherry have already moved forward on this very vigorously. Uh, on the other hand, states like Orissa actually have already moved forward by uh, moving, issuing uh, the RFPs and RFQs for uh, privatization of their respective DISCOMs. And we have seen uh, huge results out of this. You know, those of us who have lived through a period of huge power shortage in Delhi have seen the advantage of efficiency coming in uh, through the private sector in the DISCOMs in, uh, in Delhi, in a place like Delhi. And therefore, if, if we need to sustain this green movement over a long period of time, then you need to bring in great amount of efficiency in the DISCOMs. You need to ensure that your grid is better managed and you need to ensure that thefts uh, of power come to a complete uh, uh, zero level. This is very, very critical. And I think increasingly learning from what the central government has already done, the demonstration effect should come on to other, other big states. And this is, to my mind, very, very important. Uh, the other is that, uh, you know, as I was mentioning to you, uh, that, uh, you know, when you talk about manufacturing, we recognize that clean technology manufacturing is a very high tech proposition where you, you need global scales and constant innovations are critical. And that is why we came out with this uh, almost uh, to, to the cabinet announced this $2.4 billion battery giga factory scheme and about 600 million for solar PV module schemes. And the focus is on cutting edge technologies and global scales. And our view is that uh, uh, these incentives will attract local and global champions to come together and anchor the clean tech manufacturing ecosystem in the country. And this should actually logically include component suppliers, R&D centers of excellence and equipment manufacturers. Uh, and I, I'm quite sure that in the days to come, India will see huge amount of innovations and disruptions at the level of both discounts in terms of greater efficiency and at the level of a uh, much greater level of manufacturing of solar PV modules in India. You know, there was, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, weave in a question asked by Mr. Balram on uh, the, the value of green itself rather than uh, the price competitiveness that we use as a sales pitch. Should we be using the value of green as the sales pitch itself without really worrying about the costing? And I'm going to try to weave it in, in this question that I want to pose to all three of you. This is the final question for this afternoon as we wrap it up. And I'll come to Mr. Kant last. I will start with uh, Suman. Uh, uh, I will go to Kate and I'll come to you last, sir, as uh, the final comments for this afternoon session. Uh, Suman, we were, uh, uh, when I was studying climate policy and I was uh, uh, writing on that, we were told there were three big challenges, uh, technology, uh, finance, and uh, consumer choice that eventually consumers need to make a determination that what they value more. Uh, I think technology uh, has clearly moved a fair bit in the 20 years that I've been working in the sector. I think finance is still constrained. Uh, only 80% of climate finance leaves its shores. So uh, countries like India are still not receiving enough of global capital and certainly patient capital. Uh, and finally, consumer choice. I would like your thoughts on all three of these. Uh, very quickly, a minute on each of them, and I'd like to go to uh, sure. the participants as well. Where have we moved a needle on the trinity of consumer, finance, and technology on energy choice? So, you know, on technology, clearly there is a lot of development that has already happened, and the visible pipeline and technology improvements is very clear now. So, I think it's inevitable, therefore, that electricity, you know, renewable energy is going to become a much bigger aspect through things like green hydrogen and therefore mobility and so on as well. So we're going to see a lot more electrification and decarbonization of the electricity value chain. So I think that is definitely going to happen through the technology that is already in the works. So that's great news. Capital, frankly, I'm not concerned about because if you are able to give reasonable rates of return, there's enough capital slashing around in the world. That is going to just come and make investments from a commercial standpoint. So I don't think that capital is going to be a constraining factor. Um, and now that ESG investing becoming a bigger and bigger theme, 
I think that's going, that's going to drive more capital into uh, these areas. So that's not Including a concern. Including in emerging economies. Of, absolutely, it will, right? Now, the third aspect of consumer choice. I think consumer choice is, is certainly in India, it's not so, you know, the consumer demand that will, you know, very well aware, and that goes to the question also that was posed. I think consumers, you know, don't particularly care as much uh, at this point in time. There's a generational issue there. Younger folks are far more aligned to this green than. Yeah, you're perhaps you're right. Uh, you're, you're perhaps right with that. But I think that is, that awareness will develop over time. And I think already with all the pollution issues that we see in northern India, that awareness is beginning to seep in. So I think that will continue as, as people start, start seeing the advantages of things like electric mobility and you know, pollution less cars and so on. I think that advantage will begin to, begin to become more important and critical in the future as well. The fourth factor, which you will talk about, is the issue of implementation on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think is going to see a big constraining factor. That, that to me, in fact, is going to be the biggest constraining factor. In how, much, how much capacity can we actually execute? You know, the government has set a target of 450 gigawatts by 2030. It's an enormous target. It means that we have to have 370 gigawatts of new renewable energy capacity in the next 10 years, which is equal to the entire installed capacity of the entire power sector okay. in the beginning of India's history. Now, that is not going to happen easily. So I think we will try our best, of course. The government will try its best. The corporate sector will try its best. But it is going to be an enormous task to ex execute that capacity on the ground. Okay. Your take on this. Yeah, so, so I mean, basically, from a technology standpoint, um, the simplest way to describe it is basically electrify everything. Um, and the tiny bit that's left, use some hydrogen. Um, so it really is electrify everything. and. Um, even though the oil and gas sector will try and get a big share for hydrogen, actually you don't need uh, that much hydrogen. You can pretty much electrify uh, uh, most of the energy economy. Um, and it's moving in that direction. So it's really just a question of scale. Um, and as we've heard, you know, the scale of all of this is absolutely mind blowing. But if you if you put that in context, the scale of unemployment coming out of COVID is also mind blowing. Um, and there are lots of people looking for jobs. Um, and if we can put people to work in the clean energy revolution, um, that will be hugely beneficial for everybody coming out of uh, coming out of COVID. Um, on the consumer front, I absolutely agree um, that, that young people get it. Um, I mean, we're already starting to see in Europe peak car and peak meat um, amongst uh, younger people. Uh, people are moving away from meat consumption. They're moving away from buying cars. Um, and um, I think that's a trend that will only accelerate, um, although the generational differences are stark. But we still have to remember from a consumer's perspective, the damage is being done by the wealthy in the world. Um, consumption is a factor. And, and even though um, the wealthy and the wealthy countries don't like to point the finger at consumption, it is something that, that, that we will have to tackle uh, um, head on. Um, um, and, and that's going to be tricky. In terms of finance, I completely agree. There is no shortage of money, absolutely no shortage of money. It's just sitting around in the wrong places. Um, we've got a bubble in the equities sector. Um, you know, bonds aren't really delivering at the moment. There's a lot of money sitting around doing pretty much nothing. Um, so it's really about the enabling environment. And so for me, uh, India can play a really crucial role in that. Um, India is going to take over the presidency of the G20 after Italy has it in 2021. It will be India. Um, and I think you'll see also from the British G7 and from the Biden administration, a real push on re-injecting liquidity and capital into, uh, into the world. And certainly um, many of us are campaigning uh, uh, for special drawing rights and, um, and other things to be unleashed to support the transition. Um, but that money has to be equitably allocated. And I think this is a really important role for India to play as, as, as a G20 leader um, in making sure that um, the right concessional finance is available and that we move towards really significant blended capital uh, for delivery of the sustainable development goals. So not just COP26, but I think also the G7s and the G20s of the next two years will be crucial um, in providing that, that, that liquidity. But ultimately, it's about policy the attractiveness and the enabling environment in individual countries that's what drives finance but that's a good point of departure to come to mr card policy attractiveness and enabling environment challenges around technology finance and consumer behavior in india uh, kate rg20 uh, residency has been delayed by year. we'll be doing it in 2023 but we have italy indonesia and india who will have to work together uh, to go green mr card over to you 
so there are a couple of areas where uh, uh, you know certain uh, uh, critical paradigm shifts have to be made one is that uh, whether we like it or not the world would demand low carbon products and therefore uh, we have to move towards low carbon industrialization whether it's fertilizer steel all these areas will slowly and gradually have to evolve towards uh, uh, low carb clean energy secondly i think our uh, movement towards a clean shared uh, you know a shared connected and a zero emission world of mobility has just begun and i think in the next two to two, three decades as the cost of battery falls and uh, it's to my in my mind it's going to come down below 100 dollar per kilowatt hour in the next two and a half to three years and at that point even the initial cost of ownership of all vehicles will become cheaper than the combustion vehicles and therefore uh, this huge uh, revolution of electric mobility is inevitable and the earlier the industry understands it and all of us understand it the better it is and make a paradigm shift towards electric mobility uh, i would also like to emphasize that city to city movement of commercial vehicles uh, it will be very cr crucial and that will essentially be driven by hydrogen and therefore hydrogen projects especially green h2 will be very very important uh, fourthly in my mind i'm very clear that energy storage manufacturing and cutting edge batteries will drive the future both on the grid side on the electricity generation side and on the electric mobility side grid cutting edge battery storage will really be the key and lastly hybrid re that is uh, renewable energy projects, which are a combination of solar and wind storage, will be very, very uh, critical, and they will drive prices further down in the years to come, and where a lot of technological evolution will have to take place. So uh, four or five of these key areas are very important as the future unfolds itself. But the future is definitely going to be uh, a clean, uh, a fossil-free uh, future. Excellent. So, uh, you know, as by way of uh, closing uh, comments, I'm not going to try to sum it up, but if you want to know more, more about the manufacturing revolution and opportunities, if you want to read about the EV, the vehicles and the tra tra transitions, if you want to know about the China factor, if you want to know about the role of solar and various other fuels, uh, do get a copy of Fossil Free. Uh, it's very well written and it's uh, something that all of us can engage with quite easily. Uh, at this stage, let me congratulate and thank Suman for thank you. Uh, writing the book and thank for joining you, us today. Let me thank Mr. Khan for launching this book and being with us, sir. And Kate, uh, lead the good fight in UK and uh, 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 do absolutely. tell us how the vaccines how, how the vaccines turn <laughs> out because we are a few months down the line. So stay safe, wear a mask till then, and uh, see you at another ORF conversation. Thank you to all our guests and viewers. It was thank a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah.